our brethren again for blessing us in song. And this morning we're going to continue our study in Revelation chapter 12. And I would like to say uh, for our new people, we're, we're kind of way ahead. So if you find yourself lost, don't worry. We'll cover these things when we get together and study. Amen. Let us pause for another word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this privilege of studying your word. We ask, as always, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, that he will come, that he will be our great teacher, that he will lead us and guide us into all truth, that truth will be made plain to our minds, and we ask you, Lord, to open our minds that we may understand, open our ears that we may hear, and open our eyes that we may see. And Father, help us to walk with you closer today. Father, we thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. Revelation chapter 12. In our last prophecy session, we, were, we stopped at verse 10, and we talked about the dragon and the war that took place in heaven. <clears throat> and so this great controversy, as we know, is between Christ and Satan, and it's been going on even before this earth was created. The Bible tells us that there was war in heaven, and the dragon fought and Michael fought, and the dragon was cast out, and one-third of the angels were cast out with them. And the Bible says that they were cast out unto the earth. And so that warfare has continued here on the earth. And the Bible makes it clear that this same dragon, which is the devil and the serpent, uses entities on the earth in order to attack God's people. The Bible makes it clear in Revelation chapter 12 that he even tried to attack Christ at his birth. And we know the story how Herod tried to have all, not tried, he had all male children from the ages of year two on down slaughtered because of this great controversy that's going on between Christ and Satan. And the Bible makes it clear that Christ defeated him again at the cross. And the Bible makes it clear, Christ says, now has come salvation to this world. And we find that same thing being mentioned here in the book of Revelation. Notice what it says in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven, now has come salvation and the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And so we discovered on our last session that before the cross, the devil could go back and forth to heaven and accuse the brethren. We find him accusing in the book of Zechariah. In Zechariah, the high priest is making an atonement for Israel, but he's standing there with filthy garments. And the devil is at his right hand to resist him. And the Bible says, the Lord cried out, the Lord rebuked you. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? And so after the cross, after all of heaven saw what the enemy of souls did to Christ on the cross, he could no longer come up there and accuse the brethren. This is why the verse says, now is come salvation. And this loud voice was where? It was in heaven in verse 10. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of who? His Christ. And the word Christ means his anointed one. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Notice what it says in verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. The Bible here talks about a group of people on the earth that the devil is coming after, and the Bible talks about them having this overcoming power. Well, where does this power come from? Does it come from them in and of themselves? No, it is Christ 
reproducing himself within his people, and they're taking a stand because of the power that he uh, took from the enemy at the cross. When Christ came from the grave, what did he say? He said, all power in heaven and in earth, because the devil claimed the earth as his. He claimed to have ownership and authority of the earth because of what Adam and Eve did. And for a while he did, until the cross. And this is when Christ crushes the serpent's head again. So this is defeat number two. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it, there's gonna be another defeat. And the Lord is gonna crush the devil's head this time by using you and by using me. Now not because we have power, but because we have sided with Christ and we have allowed him to come into our lives and he has poured into us part of his divinity and we will overcome even as Christ overcame and this will be the last crushing of the head because his whole claim is they, they're sinful. They cannot obey and they don't deserve to go to heaven. Well, Christ is gonna have a people where he's gonna demonstrate to the devil and to the whole world and the universe that yes, they can because of Christ. You remember what Christ said in the gospels? He says, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Why should we be of good cheer? Because he overcame. Well, because his victory, he's going to share with us. His power to overcome, he's going to share with us. And he's going to give us the Holy Spirit to help us do it. So we're not doing it on our own. All we have to do is open ourselves up to receiving the Holy Spirit and be willing to obey what the Lord tells us to do. And then that power that Christ had, he's sharing with us. That's why he says, you be of good cheer because I've overcome the world and I'm going to share my victory with you. That's a beautiful thing. And they overcame him, meaning the dragon, by the blood of the lamb, which is Christ, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. What does that mean? That simply means that they love God so much and the devil is gonna come after them. He's gonna make war with them because he can no longer make war with Christ because Christ is now in heaven. So what's the next best thing? I'm going to attack his children. That's his plan. And so we have to overcome and we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Now we have to get to a place where we love not our lives unto death, even as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't love their life. They loved God more. And they said, listen, King, even if our God does not deliver us, we would rather burn than bow down to your false image. This is the place that we're gonna to have to be in. Do we love God supremely like that? Do we love God supremely? We should love God supremely, and that's very important. So let's go to the screen real quick, and I wanna show you here in Testimonies, volume five, page 470. It says, as Satan accused Joshua and his people, so in all ages he accuses those who are seeking the mercy and favor of God. In the revelation, he is declared to be the accuser of our brethren, which accused them before our God day and night. The controversy is repeated over every soul that is rescued from the power of evil and whose name is registered in the Lamb's book of life. Never is one received from the family of Satan into the family of God without exciting the de determined resistance of the wicked one. Satan's accusations against those who seek the Lord are not prompted by displeasure at their sins. He exalts in their defective characters. Only through their transgression, only through their transgressions of God's law can he obtain power over them. His accusations arise solely from his enmity to Christ. Through the plan of salvation, Jesus is breaking Satan's hold upon the human family and rescuing souls from his power. All the hatred and malignity of the arch rebel is stirred as he beholds the evidence of Christ's supremacy. And with fiendish power and cunning, he works to wrest from him 
the remnant of the children of men who have accepted his salvation. Now this is important. So because we have accepted Christ and we're walking with him and we're walking in obedience to his commandments and the Lord will pour out his spirit upon us, he will do everything in his power to tempt us to sin, to try to strip us away from God, to try to take us out of the Lord's hand. Now listen, go with me in your Bibles, hold your place in Revelation and go with me in your Bibles to Luke. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, and notice what it says, beginning with verse 25. Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, and notice what it says, beginning with verse 25. Luke 14, beginning with verse 25. When you're there, please say amen. amen. Notice what it says here. And there went a great multitude with him, and he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and yea his what his own life also he cannot be my disciple and whosoever doth not fear who does not bear his cross <clears throat> and come after me cannot be my disciple so christ is making it, 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 it he's making a line he's drawing a line he says you cannot love others more than you love me, including family, including family, which is amazing to hear because the Bible says God puts the solitary in families. Yet at the same time, if you love that child more than you love the Lord, if you won't tell that child the truth because you don't want to hurt their feelings and, and you, that's you choosing them above telling them the truth of what God said. You understand? And so we have to love God supremely. We have to love as much as I love my wife. I have to love God more than I love her. You know, and it has to be the same way. God has to be supreme. We have to love not our lives unto death. And we even have to get to a place where we love God supremely, even above our own family. Go with me now to the book of John. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, and notice what it says. Here's another scripture that supports what the Bible says in Revelation 12, that they love not their lives unto death. John chapter 16, and notice what it says in verse 33. John chapter 16, and notice what it says in verse 33. The Bible says, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Christ has overcome the world. And this is a wonderful thing for us, brothers and sisters. And because he has overcome, we too can overcome. We too can overcome. It's a wonderful thing. Let's go back to the screen here. Notice what it says here, Desire of Ages, page 122. By passing over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared the way for us to overcome. It is not his will that we should be placed at a disadvantage in the conflict with Satan. He would not have us intimidated and discouraged by the assaults of the serpent. So this is so important. So by passing over the ground which Christ uh, has passed, and Christ has passed over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared the way for us. So if we just follow in his footsteps, brothers and sisters, that will make us in uh, a safe place, put us in a safe place. It's so powerful when we look at it. So now, the Bible has a lot to say in the book of Revelation to the overcomer. And I want you to hear what Christ says to the seven churches about this. And look at the screen here. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelations 2 and verse 11, the second church. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That's good news, isn't it? Revelations 2 and verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Revelations 2 and verse 26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Revelations 3 and verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelations 3 and verse 12, he that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. 321, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father and his throne. And then at the end of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7, it says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Isn't that beautiful? All of these are promises to those that overcome. And so you don't have to fret and say, well, I don't have any power to overcome. That's okay. Guess what? Christ is going to supply the power. Christ told his disciples, he says, listen, I'm going away, but don't worry. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another comforter. I'm comforting you now, but when I go away, I'm going to send another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And when we walk in God's commandments and when we walk in obedience, God gives the Holy Spirit. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we receive power to walk this walk of faith and to overcome, even as Christ overcame. Are you with me? Amen. Let's go back to Revelations chapter 12. Notice what it says in verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Well, the devil is cast out. He can't go up there anymore and accuse the brethren before God's throne. He can't go up there anymore. So he's cast out. And so now his only theater of operation is this earth. And so the heavens are rejoicing. Oh, good. He can't come up here no more. But it's saying, but woe to the earth. Woe to you inhabitants down there. Because now he's really mad. And he can't get to Christ, so now he's coming after you. Are you with me? Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he know that he hath but a short time. Verse 13, it says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he did what? He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So here in verse 13, is a continuation of verse 6. And this is what we were talking about when the devil tried to destroy Christ. In verse 6 of Revelation 12, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she should feed her, her there a thousand uh, two hundred and three score days. And I meant to say verse 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Speaking of Christ, after the cross, Christ went back to heaven. And so after the cross, the devil could no longer go up there and accuse the brethren. He's cast down to this earth. And now he's making war with the woman. And in Bible prophecy, a woman is a church. And so he's making war with God's children down here. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Notice what it says here on the screen. These are some more passages in the New Testament that talks of overcoming. And it says, be not overcome of evil. This is Romans 12 and 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. Amen. 1 John 2.14, I have written unto you fathers 
because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. The Bible makes it clear that overcoming is a possibility in spite of what the devil tells us, in spite of what some religious leaders tell us, overcoming is a real possibility. First John 5 and verse 4. Listen to the book. For whatsoever is born of God does what? Y'all talk to me now. Y'all act like you're scared. And it's, it's on the screen. It's an open book test. You know, for whatsoever is born of God does what? Overcometh the world. And this is the victory that does what? Overcometh the world. Even our faith. So we must have faith. We must have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to have this victory. Now here's another quote from uh, Sermons and Talks, Volume 2, page 319. Do you want the gates of the city of God to be opened freely to you and you be welcomed in with your children? Do you want the crown of glory placed upon your brow? Do you not want the life that measures with the life of God? But if we are to enjoy these eternal blessings, we have sacrifices to make in this life. We must reveal that we possess a faith that lays hold upon the living God and a righteousness that overcomes sin. May God bless us here today. Volume 4, page 346, paragraph 1. When a man is earnestly engaged day by day in overcoming the defects in his character, he is cherishing Christ in his soul temple. The light of Christ is in him. Under the bright beams of the light of Christ's countenance, his entire being becomes elevated and ennobled. He has the peace of heaven in his soul. By resisting or enduring temptation, circumstances are controlled by the might of the will in the name of Jesus. This is overcoming as Christ overcame. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Let no man, uh, first selected messages, 381, paragraph 2, let no man present the idea that man has little or nothing to do in the great work of overcoming. For God does nothing without his cooperation. Neither say that after you have done all you can on your part, Jesus will help you. Christ has said, without me, ye can do how much? You can do nothing. From the first to the last, man is to be a laborer together with God. Unless the Holy Spirit works upon the human heart, at every step, we shall stumble and fall. Man's efforts alone are nothing but worthlessness. But cooperation with Christ means victory. So this is so, so, so important, brothers and sisters. It is so important. So with Christ... It means victory. So back in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Verse 14, And the woman and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. <clears throat> so when the devil saw that he was cast down, he was upset. So now he's coming to attack God's children. Notice these scriptures regarding Christ and what Jesus talked about when he came from the cross, when he got up from the grave. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, how much power? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23, is such a beautiful passage, talking about this power that Christ now has, and he's going to share that power with his church. Now watch this. And what is the exceeding greatness of, of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead 
and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now watch, how much power does he have? The highlight part. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So Christ says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Here, Paul doubles down on that notion that all, above all principality and above all power, Christ has all this power. Well, what is he going to do with all that power? He's going to share it with those who love not their lives unto the death. He will share it with us if we commit ourselves to him and we walk in his ways and in his truth. Now, listen, go with me to the book of Romans. Hold your place in Revelation. Now, I want you to notice what it says in the book of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Let me show you how much power the Lord is going to allow us to have. <clears throat> now, I already told you, Revelation shows that Christ defeated the devil in heaven because there was war in heaven, and he was kicked out, and a third of the angels were kicked out. He still had access. He could still go back and forth to accuse the brethren. Well, the devil was defeated a second time at the cross. When Christ went to the cross and he could not get Christ to sin, you remember the wilderness of temptation? He says, all these kingdoms of the earth will I give you if you just do one thing. If you just commit one sin, because he knew if Christ committed one sin, it was over. How many sins did Adam and Eve commit before they got put out of the garden? One. All he needed was Christ to sin one time. Can you imagine somebody on your heels the whole time trying to get you to have a reaction? And listen, we know how weak we are. If somebody comes up to us and slaps us in the face, well, what are we going to do? We're going to run to our car and go to the trunk, right? <laughs> We're going to pop the trunk, you know, because that's our nature. Well, Christ is here to give us a new nature to partake of his nature. Well, Christ, can you imagine people always after him? Listen, from your birth of a, a murderous king trying to have you slaughtered, from having to go into Egypt until you were a toddler and you were walking, and then you come back to Jerusalem, and every step of the way in your family, your brothers and sisters not understanding your nature, not understanding your mission. You know, so all of these things, and he grew up and became a man, and the devil was on his trail every step of the way. One sin. All he needed was one sin. Well, Christ defeated him in heaven. He defeated him here on earth at the cross because he didn't sin. The Bible says neither did he sin, nor was the gal found in his mouth. Not even the gal was found. In, no deception was in him at all. Christ said of himself to his disciples, he says, the devil cometh to me and can find nothing in me. Nothing. And here's the beautiful thing. Then he says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And if I have overcome the world, I'm going to share my power with you to help you overcome the world. Isn't that beautiful? So the last death knell for Satan is going to be this. In Romans chapter 16, go with me down to verse 20. And let's read this together, because this is so powerful. Paul says to the Roman church, let's read together. And the God of peace shall do what? Bruise Satan under your feet when? Shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So wait a minute. I thought the woman that gave birth to the seed, he crushed the serpent's head and it bruised his heel. That was talking about Christ. That was a prophet, messianic prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, talking about this conflict between Christ and Satan. And Christ was going to crush the head of the serpent and it was going to bruise his heel. Paul here is telling the, the Roman church, he said, listen, what's going to happen? The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Not right now, but shortly. Meaning the ones that's going to do it is going to be that last generation. Oh, they make fun of the, those people that hold uh, that last generation theology. That last generation theology. That last generation that's going to walk with Christ and they're going to live 
without a mediator during the worst time of Earth's history. And God is going to use those people to bruise and crush the head of Satan under your feet shortly, meaning not, not in Paul's day, but a time period to come. God is going to use a group of people to crush and bruise Satan's head short. So listen, what does that mean? That means that the Lord is going to take a group of people, this group that Satan is after, in Revelations chapter 12, and the Lord is going to use them and put them on display. Christ is going to leave the most holy place. There's no more intercession. And they're going to live without an intercessor for a while. And this demonstration, and they won't sin. This demonstration of power, of all this power, all power in heaven and earth that Christ has, he's going to share with his church, those who open themselves to it and those who avail themselves to it. Everybody's not going to get it. Because we're told that when he pours out that spirit, there's going to be some places where it could be falling on hearts all around, and they won't even know that it's being poured out. But there's going to be others that have been waiting for it and praying for it, and they kept the vessel clean and right side up. They're going to receive the fullness of it. And it's going to be a beautiful thing, brothers and sisters. And so the Lord wants to pour out his spirit so that we, through the power of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will too crush the head of the serpent shortly. Are you with me? Let's go back to Revelations chapter 12. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, when you hear that, okay, God has given this woman, and the woman is his church. He's given her two wings of an eagle so that she can fly into the wilderness where she's going to be nourished. And this, brothers and sisters, gives you the illusion. It makes you think of the children of Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt. You know why? Notice what's being on the screen. This is what the Lord told the children of Israel when he set them free from Egyptian slavery. This is what he told him in Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 and 4. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, so God speaking, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. The Lord says, I, and listen, in another place in Exodus, the Lord says, <clears throat> the Lord says, as an eagle stirreth her nest. How does the eagle stir her nest? An eagle has little eaglets inside that nest, right? And it comes a time when they keep bringing food and bringing food. Eventually that bird gets bigger and bigger. There's going to come a time there ain't enough room for everybody in the nest. And this eagle's going to have to learn how to fly. And the Bible says that the Lord says, as an eagle stirreth her nest, and God talks about how he, bear, he bore Israel on eagles. So the eagle, the eaglet will get pushed out of the nest. And he's doing this and going in circles. And that mother eagle is so fast. She can swoop right down and open her wings and bear that eaglet up while they're still trying to get their strength. And then once they get it, she lets them go. But she will bear them on. And the Lord says, this is what I did for you when you were in slavery. This is what I did for you when you were in bondage. I bore you on eagles' wings, and I brought you unto myself. Well, where did he bring them? He took Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness where he could nourish them. Did he feed them in the wilderness? Did he instruct them with his word in the wilderness? You better believe he did. Now watch this. <clears throat> Notice what it says here. Other passages of Scripture talks about God and his wings and how he protects his children. Psalm 61, verses 3 and 4. It says, For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in the tab in the, and I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert or the covering of thy wings. Amen. Psalm 61. Psalm 91 and verse 4 says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. 
So this is beautiful. The Lord is like that mother eagle. She bears us up on eagle's wings. She covers us with her wings. And here, the Bible says the church, the woman, got two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time, times. And do I even need to go over that time, times and a half times again? We know that that is the equivalent to the three and a half years. It's equivalent to the 40 and two months. It's equivalent to the 1,260 years. <clears throat> and so the church was nourished by God during the dark ages for 1,260 years. And who was the Lord protecting the church from? From the persecution during the dark ages from the papacy. The Bible is so clear about this. And the, those that would obey the commandments of God, those that would walk with the Lord and wanted the Bible undulterated, they had to flee into the wilderness. So where were they going? They were going into the mountains. They were going into mountain fastness. They were going into different valleys, secluded areas where they could worship the Lord in, in peace and not be harassed by the church, telling them what, when, where, and how with the threat of the sword, with the threat of burning them at the stake, with the threat of throwing them to wild animals. All of this is history. And those who wanted to obey God, <clears throat> excuse me, and worship him in spirit and in truth had to go underground. They had to flee into the wilderness. Well, the Bible says that they were nourished. But what were they nourished with? The Bible says that they were nourished. Let's look at this. Let's go with me. Go with me to uh, Acts of Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, we're going to read verses 2 and 3. They were nourished for a time, times, and a half a time. We know that's the 1,260-year period. Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3, notice what it says. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall be tread underfoot for how long? Forty and two months. So 40 and two months is the same as three and a half years. Notice what it says in verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. So the 40 and two months and the 1,260 years are the same. It's just being written and said in a different way. And the Lord says my two witnesses will prophesy during this time. So the Lord says his church will go into the wilderness. And while his church is in the wilderness, she shall be nourished for 1,260 years or for 40 and two months or for three and a half years, all the same. Well, what is she nourished with? The two witnesses are nourishing her. Do you remember who the two witnesses were? We studied that and learned that it's the Old and New Testament. It was the word of God that was nourishing the church. <clears throat> Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 12. And notice what it says in verse 6. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that she should be what? Feed her, that they should feed her their 1,203 score days. Same thing. Well, what is she being fed? She's being fed the word of God. She's being fed the word of God. Now listen, the Bible makes it clear. Let's look at some verses that bear this out. Go with me to, for, uh, well, in 1 John, you don't even have to turn to it. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word? That's Jesus, right? That's talking about Jesus. Now, Jesus says of himself in John chapter 6 and verse 35, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, any man eat my flesh, they have life in them. So if any man refuse to eat my flesh, they, they won't have any life in them. So Jesus is referring to himself <clears throat> as bread. Do you know other places in the Bible refers to the word of God as food? And so let's look at it. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. I'm sorry, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Listen to this. The Bible refers to the word as food. First Peter chapter 2 
And notice what it says in verse 2. Are we there? The Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Isn't that beautiful? Desire the sincere milk of the word. The Bible also makes it clear that in other places of scripture that there should come a time when we get off milk and we should start eating meat, right? And that's found in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and I want you to notice how it's written here in Paul's, in Paul's writings here. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. The Bible says, For when the time, for when, I'm sorry, for when for the time when ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And he said, he, I'm sorry, let me read that again. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first oracle, principles of the oracles of God and are become such as need milk and not strong meat. So in other words, he says, you all are still on the bottle when you should be eating table food. You should be eating meat, right? <clears throat> Verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So here again, the Bible says this woman is brought into the wilderness in a place that was prepared by God where she is nourished for 1,260 years. And here, the word, and the, in the, in they're being nourished by the Old and New Testament. All right? Now, brothers and sisters, this is very powerful. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. Let's try to wrap this up. So the woman is in the wilderness, verse 14. Two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time. Verse 15, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. <clears throat> now, what is water in Bible prophecy? In Bible prophecy? Well, let, well let's look at it. Let, let's look at it because you, you, we, we're looking at it. We don't know. All right. Go to chapter 13 and notice what it says in verse 1. We're going to find out what water, what these floods represent in Bible prophecy. Revelation 13 and verse 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a great beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name blasphemy. Now, a beast in Bible prophecy is a nation or a kingdom, right? And if it rises out of the sea, we got to find out what that means. Go to Revelation 17 and verse 15. Revelation 17 and verse 15. Revelation 17 and verse 15, and it says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So waters... It's peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues. So if the dragon spewed out of his mouth a flood of waters after the woman to try to destroy the woman, he was using nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. He was using multitudes to try to destroy. So this system was in control of nations, and it was using the military might of these nations in order to carry out its decrees, its anathemas, and its bulls against those who just simply wanted to follow the word of God as it reads. And the Bible says they sent water as a flood after the woman. But here's the beautiful thing. Verse 16 says this, the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now you say, how in the world can the earth help the woman? <clears throat> well, the earth helped the woman in this sense. If you go back to Revelation 13, there's another beast that comes up out of the earth. 
So, and it's making a contrast to the first beast of Revelation 13, verse 1, that comes up out of the sea. So if a beast comes up out of the sea, it's coming up from where there's a lot of multitudes and peoples. Notice what it says in verse 11 of Revelation 13. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, meaning this system is going to come up where there's not a lot of people. There are not multitudes and peoples and masses there. And so there was a land further west that had been discovered, they claimed by Columbus, but that's debatable. <laughs> but there's a land further west in the Western Hemisphere, and we call it the United States of America. And it was discovered, and people were coming over here from the old world in droves to escape inquisitions, to escape religious persecution. And they came here, and America was founded on the principle, principles of religious freedom and civil liberties. And that earth, in this sense, helped the woman. Now, let's look at it. Let's go to the screen. So we know that America uh, started rising around this 1798. This 1798 is significant <coughs> because this is the end point of the 1,260-year period of the Dark Ages. And so let's look at it. The USA, the rise of this nation is described immediately after the deadly wound of the first beast in 1798. At the very time, the USA was indeed coming up. Now, it wasn't the discovery of America, but this is when America finally got its independence from England, and it started establishing its constitution, and it started establishing the principles by which they were going to be governed. And they said that we want a state without a king, and we want a church without a pope. This was their slogan. This is what they said. So 1776, they declared their independence. War of Independence, 1775 through 1783. A constitution was voted, 1787. A constitution was ratified one year later, 1788. First president elected, 1789. Who was the first president of the United States? If you get it wrong, we're going to have to put you out. No, George Washington, 17, 1789. Then we had a Bill of Rights. And these Bill of Rights are what protects us from the tyranny. This United States of America put in their constitution as a separation of church and state. Congress shall make no laws with the establishment of a religion, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. So this earth, this newfound place that didn't have many people here, now there were Indians here, but it wasn't the, the masses that we find in the other world. So we have a place that's setting up a government that's for the people, by the people, and of the people, and it's protecting their religious freedoms and their, their civil liberties, and you have liberty of conscience to choose or not to choose, to do or don't, you know, and without any penalty from the church or from the state. <laughs> so the Bill of Rights was that big protection that we have. The Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791. Well, that deadly wound came in 1798. So as one system is receiving a deadly blow, another system is coming up, and the earth helped the woman. And America has been a beacon of freedom from that time, but now we know we're going to study this when we get to chapter 13. There's going to be a change that's coming, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to have to talk about it, so it's very interesting. So the earth helped the woman. The devil sent out a flood of waters. He sent out militaries and multitudes to crush this woman, to crush the church. And the devil used states and kings and peoples to do it. And God helped the woman. The earth helped the woman. Opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. And so there was a space where freedoms could be established. And a government could be established that would protect the people. They don't want inquisitions over here. We don't want religious tyranny over here. We don't want a government where the church is telling the government what to do. Now that's going to change. We're going to talk about it when we get to chapter 13. And it's unfortunate. So let's wrap this up. <clears throat> so 
It says here, Zechariah's vision of Joshua the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the great atonement, great day of atonement. The remnant church will then be brought into great trial and distress. Those who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus will feel the ire of the dragon and his host. Satan numbers the world as his subjects. He has gained um, control even of many professing Christians. But here is a little company who are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph will be complete. As he influenced the heathen nations to destroy Israel, so in the near future, this is what we are going to be studying, he will stir up the wicked powers of the earth to destroy the people of God. Men will be required to render obedience to human edicts in violation of the divine law. This is important, brothers and sisters, because as we keep going, we're going to find out in chapter 13, this system is going to create laws that will say that if you do not receive the mark of the beast, you cannot buy or sell. Many will be thrown into prison. Some will be put to death. And this newfound country is going to help make, a, make an image to that first beast. It's going to be history repeating itself. Unfortunately, and the Bible prophecy predicts that this is exactly what will happen. And so we're going to have to be in a place where we love God supremely and love not our lives unto the death. Are you with me? All right. <laughs> Last one. Sons and daughters of God. The fallen world is the battlefield for the greatest conflict the heavenly universe and earthly powers have ever witnessed. It was appointed as the theater on which would be fought out the grand struggle between good and evil, between heaven and hell. Every human being acts a part in this conflict. No one can stand on neutral ground. Do you know there are only going to be two groups in the end? Either you're going to have the mark of the beast or you're going to have the seal of God. And which one do you want? I want the seal of God. We want the seal of God. Well, the Bible tells us what we must do in order to have the seal of God. We must obey the commandments of God. We must obey the command, all of the commandments of God. All right? So every human being is to act a part in this conflict. No one can stand on neutral ground. Men must either accept or reject the world's redeemer. All are witnesses either for or against Christ. Christ calls upon those who stand under his banner to engage in the conflict with him as faithful soldiers that they may inherit the crown of life. They have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Christ has left them his assured promise that great will be the reward in the kingdom of heaven of those who partake of his humiliation and suffering for the truth's sake. Those who in the strength of Christ overcome the great enemy of God and man will occupy a position in heavenly courts above angels who have never fallen. Brothers and sisters, let's continue it as we close. Notice what it says in Revelation 12 and verse 17. And the dragon, the dragon was wroth. That word wroth means angry. The dragon is the devil. He was angry with the woman, and the woman in Bible prophecy is God's church. And he went to make war with the remnant. That word remnant means the last of, the last part, that last generation. He went to make war with the remnant of her seed, and here are the identifying marks of the remnant. We're going to talk more about that on next week, by God's grace. They keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They keep the command. God's church keep the commandments. So this is a clue that tells us that a false system of religion is going to try to pull you away from the commandments of God. And they're going to try to legislate false commandments under the penalty of death. Either you worship the image of the beast and receive his mark in, his fore in your forehead or in your hand, or you won't be able to buy or sell, or you may be put to death, or you may put in, be put in prison. But the seal of God, you just have to love God. You just have to love God. God says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. The Bible says if we love God, his commandments won't be grievous to us. It won't be a problem. Unless a system comes along and they enforce another law 
and they make it a penalty if you don't obey. The Bible talks about all this, and it talked about it years ago. Years ago. We're going to stop here, by God's grace. And next Sabbath, by God's grace, we're going to deal with verse 17 in more depth. In more depth. And, um, and we want to move on eventually into chapter 13, where we talk about these two beasts. Very interesting. And what we're looking at now, brothers and sisters, is showing us where we are. We've studied prophecy in a historical sense. But now we're up to our day. We're up to our time. And so we're looking at where we are and what roles we play the rest of the way. Who believes the word of the Lord this morning? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this study. And we ask you, dear God, to strengthen us in our commitment to you. Help us to be like this woman that was fled into the wilderness. And they overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Help us to be faithful unto death. Help us to be filled with your spirit. Help us to be led by your Holy Spirit. Help us to receive the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for hearing us, and we thank you for this time with you. In Jesus' blessed name, amen.